Starting at number 10 is wood blocking. The Ming Dynasty was a prosperous era of China, and one of the main reasons was their invention of color print woodblock, paper, and two tone color printing. It surpassed all preceding printing techniques that were around before. What made this unusual, however, was that the Ming Dynasty continued to progress in printing, something that had been studied and slightly advanced by the previous Yuan Empire. Despite many scientists having thrived during the Yuan Empire, much of their culture as well as their inventions were destroyed to rid the country of Mongol influences. After after the end of their empire, as the Ming Dynasty aimed to re-establish the traditional Chinese values the way they saw fit. When they held on to the Mongols' advancements with printing, it's because they were also incorporating new technologies from European trades. The original printing had spread literacy among all classes, but it was struggling as there was many Chinese characters to use and not enough in set print. So the Ming Dynasty built off of this invention and created moving metal stamps and a machine that could move and swap the tiles around. This printing machine incorporated Chinese printing methods with the European printing press and the newfound moving technology that made printing easier than ever. The dynasty name is number 9. Unlike kingdoms and empires found everywhere else in the world such as Greece, Rome, the Ottomans, to name a few, a Chinese dynasty was named by and after whatever family heaven deemed appropriate. Chinese emperors believed that the heavens bestowed them with a hereditary divine mandate to rule, thus their official name Tianqi, which officially means son of heaven. If the the heaven saw fit for another family to have this title, it could be withdrawn and bestowed upon them at any given time. This could be in the form of war, an emperor being conquered by another family, or subjugating the throne or a coup. This is why ancient China has different emperors and empire names to different time periods, Ming Dynasty, Zhang Dynasty, Jiajing to name a few. As a result, emperors spent a lot of time and resources to try and ensure the continuation of their family on the throne. Rituals were one of those resources. Many rituals were seasonal and by the time the time the Ming Dynasty was in place, there were an average of one a month. They could be performed in dance, movement, and sacrifices, the only one practiced by members of the Ming court. These rituals would be debated and revised under each dynasty leader. It was crucial that any sitting emperor perform them to demonstrate how he was the rightful emperor as it validates their position within the system and thus validates the system itself. We'll be circling back to talk about the Mandate of Heaven ideology at a later point. Number 8 is the Nine Kneeling Rituals. The practice of kneeling isn't seen much in many other ancient cultures, but it was one of the most common daily traditions and social customs in ancient China. There are nine categories even, and they are acutely named the nine kneeling rituals. Among them, the first four are seen consistently in daily life, and the other five are only more for special occasions. A special occasion could be a funeral or addressing a serviceman or woman. The grandest of kneeling was reserved for officials meeting their emperor, and we'll be covering that in another part of the countdown later. Some more commonplace occasions would be newly weds kneeling three times in a wedding ceremony, or hosts of an event expressing greetings to all, even how a junior must always kneel to their senior. What started in ancient times as a practical greeting developed into a way to express respect, obedience, gratitude, love, and more. Number 7 is the worshipping of heaven, earth, and ancestors. As I mentioned, rituals were one of the emperor's duties, and annually he would fulfill the religious responsibilities of the temple of heaven ceremony. The emperor would make the journey up to the temple, when he worshipped there it was believed that he was worshipping heaven and the earth as his symbolic parents, upholding the ancient ideology that the emperor was not divine but divinely appointed. This differs vastly from many kingdoms where men would appoint themselves as god status, as you might have heard in a lot of our other videos. This worship was a way to ensure society was in natural order, an aspect of cosmic order of heaven, earth, and society as a three. Also by worshipping his own ancestors at the temple, which is filial loyalty and an obligation of all regardless of of social stature, it was believed to strengthen a dynasty hold on the throne. So let's talk more about the ritual in number 6, the three prostrations and nine katows. When the emperor worshipped at the temple of heaven, he executed the ritual of the three prostrations and nine katows. Under the command of a high ranking court member of the emperor's choosing, he would be told to prostrate, it's kind of like planking, and then katow, a type of kneel that he would do once, twice, and then a third time. Each time the emperor would be touching his head fully to the ground. Next he would be told to rise again, then repeat another sequence, and another, for a total of three prostrations followed by three kneels. This ritual was important for more than just the emperor. The phrase, from imperial court down to our village, was commonly found in widely circulated documents of the time. That's because a ritual like this could be performed by an ordinary farmer at his father's funeral, or a parent blessing their son. People used this ritual, as well as its widespread use, as an expression of interconnection and commonality that broke boundaries between social class and status. 
status. Unique utensil guidelines is number five. The Ming Dynasty was one of many dynasties to have limitations on utensil availabilities throughout the status rank. Household items weren't just bought and used at random, and oftentimes a piece could have a very specific purpose, even for just one dish alone. First up, it's how precious golds and solid jade wares were only used for the royal family, not even their courts or high status officials. Let me emphasize that again solid jade utensils. This was written into government regulations as early as the Tang Dynasty. Anyone found breaking these regulations could be punished and the items confiscated. There were a few small stories of this in the Ming Dynasty, with concubine thieves even. Similarly, rosewood lacquered wood was only for the royal families. You couldn't even buy the lacquer, it was purely resourced and provided to the royal family carpenters. There were even stipulations on the right to use certain garments and tools made of certain materials, but also that had specific aesthetic visual. For example, certain tent shapes were reserved for royal family, and bed clothes couldn't be made out of certain materials. I will say, it would be absolutely spectacular to have a meal cooked in a jade cauldron, stirred with solid gold spoons, and then served in more jade with more gold utensils. They really had luxury down packed. For number four, we learn what is the mandate of heaven. All right, so I said we'd cover this a little bit more. We're going to use the conquering of the Ming Dynasty to explain, as this mandate existed before and after the Ming Dynasty, and was how they even became a dynasty in the first place. When the Manchus conquered and overthrew the reigning Ming Dynasty to establish the Qing Dynasty, they announced how Ming had lost the mandate of heaven. However, they continued the worship of Ming emperors throughout their 268 year rule. Why do this? Because the mandate of heaven was centered on the principle of legitimacy, meaning that the Ming and the dynasties before them had the legitimacy and held the mandate at one point in time. To reinforce the claim on the mandate, they acknowledged that the Ming's legitimate claim to it was in the past. So, as unusual as it may seem, by continuing the worship of the Ming emperors, they asserted the legitimacy of the Qing dynasty system that could be dictated who's rightfully to be a Chinese emperor, as I previously explained. This mandate by worshipping the previous Mings allowed them to present themselves to the populace as the sons of heaven, rather than as conquering foreigners who had no legitimate claim over China. This was done by anyone who conquered China as foreigners in order to be seen as the new power. Once in the title of Mandate of Heaven, the Emperor was the mediator between heaven and earth, and a major participant in all cosmic actions. He must conduct himself as such, or there could be serious repercussions. If things went wrong, a bad crop year for instance, the Emperor could be held responsible and even overthrown. When such an overthrow would take place, it's understood that the Emperor had lost Mandate of Heaven. So yeah, ancient China was actually just really classy and fair about how they overthrew people. Number three is Ritual Music System. So, divided into two parts, ritual and music, each side had a purpose. The part of ritual is to divide people's identity and social norm, forming hierarchy. Meanwhile, the music is based on that hierarchical system's etiquette, using music as an alleviation of social conflicts. Developed from older shamanic traditions, it seemed to have a cosmic significance and representative of balance between yin and yang, the fire elements. By regulating ritual and music, it strengthened the people's concept of hierarchy in society and played a role in establishing authority and standardized rulings across civilization. Seeing music and rituals surrounding it divided by class structure is truly unique, as it's unusual only being found in this region of the world at the time. Dance at the time in China was also associated with sorcery and even shamanic ritualism. Documented in ancient records, there are examples of performing rain dances in times of drought. It was also believed you could communicate between God and man via dance and music. Number two is the meeting rites. Who knew meeting someone or introducing yourself could be so complicated? Meeting rites were important and differed per individual, especially as gifts were presented in accordance to this ritual. Ordinary people and officials had to kneel when seeing an emperor, and low ranking officials did the same when meeting a high ranking official. To meet an official of any kind, you were to visit their reception and deliver a name card request. You may only see that official if the request was approved. It's all about respect. While the most complicated it would get for officials to meet one another was to do a slight bow and fold their hands in salute, it was a lot more trouble to meet noblemen. A nobleman host would be greet visitors at the door and they would exchange bows before and after entering the doorway. Naturally, dinner would always be provided for a guest before they left, but they did bow to one another before and after exiting the doorway once again. Ironically, commoners actually had stricter greeting rules. They should always move to roadsides to greet officials, and if sitting in a wagon at the time themselves, they must hastily exit at the first opportunity to show respect. They were also expected to have high respect for one another. Otherwise, they could be punished, especially if meeting rights between the sexes were breached. 
reached. Men and women genuinely weren't allowed to meet face to face at the time, and if they had to, then the women were usually in a veil and would curtsy slightly, all ten fingers closed together over her heart. Should you be meeting the elderly, you must be incredibly serious, look steadily forward and do not move your hands or feet. If they were to gift you something, you must accept it with both hands. You use a gentle tone and speak slowly. If you were to encounter an elder on the road, you must speak if spoken to, but if not, stand aside young gun. And now for number one, you may need to respect your elders but don't forget to avenge your parents. A real law that existed for some time during the Ming Dynasty and a few others was that one must avenge the murder of their parents. The reason for this, as I'm sure you can guess, goes along with the heavy respect for elders in Chinese culture. While that's not unusual by any means, many cultures have this mindset, the open encouragement of this type of revenge is very unusual and unique. Especially because you could still be punished for this revenge even if it was encouraged by society. You're not supposed to accept living in the same world as someone who has killed your parents, as they were seen as the enemy and scourge of the earth. For this reason, many revenge stories were spread through Chinese literature. Number 10, it's happy name day to you. Birthdays are basic and boring. Here in ancient Greece, we practice name days, a celebration of your birth title. In ancient Greece, names were deemed incredibly important and were given in a way meant to ideally define what a person would be like and grow to be. A great example is Aristotle, a compound name with Aristos meaning best and Telos meaning end. Pretty fitting and ironic for someone who would become the best philosopher of the time and also have a pretty not great end. Anyways, this importance of names meant that every name had its own special day in the calendar. So instead of celebrating your exit of the womb, you'd wait for whatever day was your given one and coincided with your name and that's what you'd celebrate. Name days aren't just in Greek culture and can be found in ones such as Eastern Europe and the Balkan regions and some still celebrate name day to this day. Some of us still get phone calls from angry ants wondering why they weren't wished happy name day on Facebook. Since it rhymes with wine, number 9 is water it down. We know that many ancient civilizations didn't drink water due to how polluted it was. Whether that pollution was salt or feces, well it varied. Anyways, while many drank beer, the Greeks drank wine. However, drinking alcohol at every time of the day doesn't mean that there's a free pass to be drunk. Quite the opposite actually, as heavy drinking and drunkenness was looked down upon and seen as an embarrassment. This is because the Greeks associated it with barbarism, and many of their gods and their pantheons behaviors and stories also attributed to this. Wine without water was only used as medicine for sick or during travel as a tonic. As a result, the Greeks may have been pounding back the wine, but it was water diluted ratio, so the standard was 1 to 4. They even had a special container for mixing, boiling, and then cooling this diluted mixture. Oh, and by the way, it was seawater they were using, because apparently to quote, seawater gives the wine a curious salinity which mixes with the sweetness of the grape and produces a delicate taste, while at the same time preserving the wine for longer. Number 8 is he who must not be named. This is one of the pettiest and most specific ones you'll probably ever hear, and it's all because one dude screwed up so phenomenally it started an actual tradition. So what happened here was there was this Greek shepherd named Aristratus, and this guy had an idea one day to, you know, set fire to and destroy the temple of Artemis in Esphus. So keep in mind he did this in an era where the Greeks revered their gods the way that modern day religions like Christianity, Judaism, Islam, etc. do. These gods are real to them, so why would they destroy her temple? Which by the way is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world in our modern time. When pissed off Greeks came and found him to ask that same question, Aristotle essentially said his only intention in doing this was to achieve fame and his name to go on into history, the way that Alexander or Achilles had. He didn't care if it was in a good or a bad way, he just wanted that. Well, the entirety of Greece collectively said F that, once his intentions were revealed mentioning his name or naming children Aristotle was forbidden at the risk of being sentenced to death penalty. And so it became tradition that no one in Greece was to have that name. Number 7 is don't open dead outside. In traditional Grecian lore, it was said that there was these walking dead as creatures. Legend forewarns that these creatures would rise from the graves at night to knock on the door of innocent civilians, saying their names repetitively as a lure to open up, as these creatures kind of in a, like a vampire fashion have to be invited in. If you didn't answer your door on the first knock, you were safe and no harm could come to you. However, if people were unfortunate enough to answer, they would die after a few days and then would be transformed into one of these creatures themselves. This is why the Greeks had a tradition, arguably even a superstition, that you should never answer the door on the first knock. Many still follow this tradition to date. Number 6, you don't want to be the bigger man. We've all seen the Grecian statues, whether in photo format or lucky enough to see them in galleries or in the country it's themselves. But what we can all agree on is there's one added appendage that's hard to avoid noticing. Or is 
it. You may have noticed on male statues from ancient Greece that while they include his private regions, they are noticeably quite, well, small on every single statue. Well, this is a tradition that actually has an explanation that's nothing to do with shrinkage. In ancient Greece, a small package was actually coveted and seen as the pinnacle of male form. This is because it was consistently depicted in their lore that being well endowed was something for the mundane or barbarians. So traditionally in ancient lore, only foolish males ruled by lust had large, well, you get the idea. Finally, an explanation for the question we've all thought, but uh, nobody said out loud. Number five is the dirty gal. And sadly, it is so not in a fun way, rather the opposite. For some wild reason, the Greeks believed women had a really unique susceptibility to the things deemed impure. This is everything gross you could think of. So pus, feces, discharges and secretions, animal dung, rotten foods, the whole shebang. These things affected women in a way they did not affect men. Sure, it didn't mean she was more easily grossed out by it, but it also must mean that it's better for her. So naturally, literal filth became part of the treatments for ladies. One awful example is how a woman suffering from a discharge could be prescribed to drink roasted meal dung mixed with hot wine. If you lost your baby amidst that tragedy, they'd be rubbing cow dung all over you. If you've seen some of our medieval videos, you may have heard about the whole wandering womb concept of the olden times, where people believed that a womb could just wander around inside a woman's body or just vacate it entirely as if it's got little legs. Well, anyways, the whole reason for the cow dung thing is they believe that the womb would be so disgusted by the smell of dung that it would run away and leave her of the trauma. And so the tradition for terrible, filthy medicine for the women of Greece carried on for centuries. Number four is another questionable medical tradition, plan sneeze. So this is the fault of one dude specifically. Unlike Estrostratus, he didn't get his name banned forever, however. So Greek physician Soneris was one of the best women's physicians you could find. No concept of how a woman's body worked and full confidence that he did. Perfect combo. He pitched that if women didn't want to get pregnant after, you know, doing it, they should squat, sneeze, and rinse. And just like that, you're pregnancy immune. Well, word spread of this method that allowed people to avoid weird olden contraceptives and not get preggers, so tons of people did it and tons of people got pregnant. Unfortunately, word of it not working did not spread as fast as the rumor that it did, and this tactic carried on in many regions of Greece for decades. Don't worry, Sonaris had a couple backup ideas. He also suggested rubbing honey or cedar resin on your hoo-ha before getting down, which was probably entirely too efficient between the mess and the burning sensation, making people just call it quits on the act altogether for a while. Number three is before he cheats. Hold off on the baseball bat and the keys, Carrie. The Greeks got this one covered. Infidelity was a huge no-no and was even classified as a crime in ancient Greek customs. This went on for both men and women. If you were to be called before the courts and found guilty of this act, there were a few punishments, none of which maimed or ended your life. No, 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 no. They were quite unique. One of the most common was to insert peeled ginger root into the genital orifices of a man or a woman. This would cause intolerable burning sensation and pain to the intimate parts of the unfaithful. Another one was to have the pubic hair on your derriere burnt off with smoldering ash, which sounds just… I mean another option was a radish that had small holes in it pushed in your back door, which would be very itchy and very burny. Yeah, suffice to say cheating on your partner back then wouldn't result in getting your stuff tossed out on the front lawn or your PS5 drowned, more so in a seriously ingrained lesson on commitment via vegetables. Number two is the phallic festival. Huzzah! The time has come for us all to gather in the Acropolis and gaze down on the wondrous sight of oh, hoo hoo. I mean, if you're a visitor, sure, your reaction may be one of shock, but to the people of Athens, this tradition was highly cultivated and something people looked forward to year round. Once a year, their roads would come alive with all kinds of depictions and representations of male genitalia. This happened during the annual Dionysus celebration, a god of pleasure and wine, where men and women would march down the streets holding giant phalli proudly above their heads as a tribute to their gods, all while drunk out of their minds and on their way in a phallic procession to the temple of Dionysus. According to Aristotle, phallic processions were the birthplace of comedic theater. He claimed that people adapted the jokes they'd yell during the parade processions into full stage plays. So if Aristotle's right, all comedy began with the Greeks carrying giant cartoony dongs. And it's number one, the axe did it. Ah, projection, everyone's favorite guilt relief. This fable begins when the Athenians sacrificed foods and vegetables to the gods, not animals. Ironically, this is how they start. An altar for Zeus had been set up holding grains and cakes as a sacrifice, and when a wandering ox came across the altar, it trampled much of it and ate the sacrificial food. Well, like I previously mentioned, their gods were very real to them, and a man named Thalon, in anger, then killed the ox with an axe. Thalon was the first Athenian in the city to 
to have killed an ox and he fled, leaving the axe behind at the crime scene. The witnesses to the scene were shocked by the event and moved to prosecute Thelon for the murder of the ox. Despite his absence, they held a trial to charge Thelon, but it still didn't resolve the sense of communal responsibility for the murder of an ox going on without justice. An oracle spoke up, telling the Athenians they should eat the ox in a feast and repeat the sacrifice every year to compensate. So the next year, a group of ox were to be led to the original altar. Whatever one ate from the altar, that was the one to be killed. He was struck with an axe and then killed by a member of the Athelonian family, who would then throw the axe down and run away just like their ancestor. The other participants in the ritual then butchered and skinned the animal with a sacrificial knife and feasted on the meat. This could not be the end of the ritual, however, because a crime had been committed. The ox had been slain, just like before, so it's back to square one with another trial. Since the ox slayer had to flee, the girls who brought the water for sharpening the weapon were charged. Their defense was that those who actually sharpened the axe and knife were more responsible. The sharpeners in turn charged the man who gave them the axe and knife, and then that guy, he charged the butcher. But the butcher claimed the knife was more guilty because it did the cutting, and since the knife could say nothing in its defense, it was found guilty. And then the knife was banished by being thrown into the sea. To conclude this bizarre ritual, back on Acropolis, the skin of the ox was stuffed, stood up, and harnessed to a plow, restoring it to its pre-sacrificial condition. And so they did this every year for centuries. The end. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have Wards of the King. This messed up marriage tradition comes from the Dark Ages, the medieval times, and during these times, since people were seen less as people and more as what they can provide, orphans who were wealthy female heiresses, as well as wealthy widows, all became wards of the king. That is dark in itself, but since marriage is all about money, the king used these people to his advantage. These women could be married off to the men of the court who wanted to increase their wealth and land, or a lord who would also be able to sell her marriage to the highest bidder in order to make up for the loss of income she would have provided. If one of these women went and married someone on her own accord, she would then lose the money that was rightfully hers. How absolutely backwards is that? In our number 9 spot today, we have the Bridal Bouquet. The Bridal Bouquet is definitely a classic staple in Western society now, but it wasn't always just a nice aesthetic touch. The idea of the Bridal Bouquet has a much different history. It is said that ancient Greek brides would often wear wreaths of mint and marigold, meant to serve as an aphrodisiac for the newlyweds, but I want to take us over to the Middle Ages. During this time, things and people were filthy. The concept of hygiene didn't really exist in the way that it does now, and this meant that people were usually pretty smelly. This is why it became tradition for brides walking down the aisle to carry a bouquet that was full of herbs like dill and garlic. The bouquet served as a sort of deodorant for the bride, and it also worked to ward off evil spirits. Sort of like an awesome two for one deal right there in one bouquet. Dill was also like a triple whammy because apparently it too is considered an aphrodisiac, so having some on hand post nuptials pre consummation was just the icing on the cake for the pair. In our number eight spot today, we have the bridal veil. There are a lot of historical wedding traditions that have to do with warding off evil spirits. People were really concerned about that back in the day. This is one of the major factors behind why the bridal veil was created. Back in Roman times, the veil was actually a red sheet called a flamium, which was meant to look like fire so as to scare off any evil spirits that were lurking around. In Greece, the veil was often yellow for the same reason. Over time, the color changed, but the intent remained the same. It was worn as a sort of protection. In the end, another reason for the use of the veil was to assist in arranged marriages. What I mean by this is that back in the day, when marriage was simply more of a business exchange than anything, sometimes veils were used to hide the identity or appearance of the bride from the groom. Definitely not the most kind tradition there's ever been. In our number 7 spot today, we have wedding rings. Both wedding and engagement rings are common in our society today, but this practice has been around for quite some time, although it used to mean a very different thing. The tradition of wedding ring exchange can be traced back to ancient Rome, but it wasn't an exchange that happened between partners at the wedding ceremony, and was instead something that was given by Roman men to the 
the father of the bride as a symbol of his purchase. This practice later evolved into the bride being given a gold ring that she would wear, which was meant to symbolize the fact that the groom had placed his trust in her. He was trusting her with his property. As for the reason we wear rings on our fourth finger, well, rings have been worn on many fingers throughout history, but the reason why this finger was chosen was because it was believed that the fourth finger held a vein that led to the heart, which in Latin was called the vena amoris, or the vein of love. In our number 6 spot today we have the bridal auction. Ancient Mesopotamia had a slew of rules and customs regarding marriage. There's one thing that the Roman historian Herodotus recorded quite well. While many of his stories are largely unreliable, this is one ancient wedding custom that has thankfully been lost to time. The bridal auction was exactly what it sounds like. It was an annual market where young, available women were auctioned off to be married. Those who were considered more beautiful were auctioned off first, and those who were deemed less desirable were auctioned after, along with a quote, monetary compensation, which was said to make up for their appearance. Harsh. Some of the most wealthy men in the area would come to the auction to find the most attractive girl possible, but even some of the men without a bunch of money came to bid a bit later in the game. In our number 5 spot today we have wedding baths. This is one of the most serious of all of the wedding traditions that were seen in ancient Greece, and it was a key part of the pre-wedding rituals for brides-to-be. This ritual bath involved water being carried in a special ceremonial vase called the lutrophore to the bride's chamber for this bathing practice. This ritual was actually so important to the people of the time that much of the time, should a young woman meet an untimely fate before being married, they would still perform this bathing ritual on the woman post-mortem. Sometimes they would even be buried with the ceremonial vase as well, even though they had never had the chance to marry. This ceremony was intended to purify the bride and also to enhance her ability to have children. It was seen as the most important milestone in a girl's journey from adolescence into adulthood. In our number 4 spot today we have courtly love. So we've discussed a bit about how medieval marriages were mostly about the transferring of wealth and land and really didn't have much, if anything, to do with love. This would obviously be a less than ideal way of living, so to make things a little more bearable, there was the practice of courtly love. This of course was for members of the court and it allowed lords and ladies to experience love despite their marital status. This was actually a huge hit and so many people became involved that there ended up being a list of rules posted, one of which included the rule, marriage is no real excuse for not loving. The courtly love saw people doing things such as dancing and giggling, and if they really wanted to get a little risque, they'd even hold hands. Sex, of course, was forbidden, however, because there are some boundaries while you're married, all right? It's just sad that people were in these loveless marriages and had to resort to things like this, all because they simply weren't allowed to marry for love. I am glad, though, that they were able to have some kind of freedom, I guess. In our number three spot today, we have double consanguinity. Double consanguinity is the case that comes up when there is consanguinity from two sources, meaning some sort of familial relationship from two places. This was important in medieval times because it was common for two siblings and one royal family to marry two siblings from another royal family. The children of these couples would be considered double first cousins. They would be allowed to marry as first cousins, but they technically had an even closer biological relationship than first cousins did. This might be a little strange to a lot of us now, based on most of our ways of living and the law, but these rules were formed before the concept of genetic relationships and DNA was even known, so there of course would seemingly be nothing wrong with it during those times in history. In our number 2 spot today we have the Viking party. Ok, we've all been to a wedding before where we maybe got a little too loose, had a little too much fun, but let me tell you right now, no one did it like the Vikings. An important aspect of a Viking wedding ceremony was mead. It was a legal requirement for the bride and groom to drink a specially brewed bride ale together at the feast that took place after the wedding ceremony. It was an important step in making sure that the marriage was a binding one. The happy couple would need to ensure that there was at least a month's worth of ale ready for the wedding day, and it needed to be continually drunk throughout their honeymoon as well. The first serving of the bride ale was presented to the groom by his new wife in what was known as the loving cup. Before the groom takes his first sip, he would likely consecrate the ale to Thor by making the sign of a hammer over it, and a toast to Odin.
Odin. Then he would sip the ale before passing the cup to his wife. She would then make a toast to Freya before having her sip, and then it was officially party time. In our number one spot today, we have purity. Of course, women have been subject to the weird standards of purity for hundreds and hundreds of years, but it was so bad in the medieval times that it was very common for women to have to take a type of purity test in order to assure her new husband. We won't get into the multitude of reasons why that is both horrible and extremely bizarre because we would be here all day, but I will talk about this test that they felt necessary to do. For royals, the wedding night was usually watched by observers, which is very weird, but in an even weirder turn of events, after the marriage was consummated, it was normal for the sheets to be checked for blood. For people who were lower class, they didn't usually have observers, but there was apparently a rule for these couples that would allow the local ruler to have sex with the bride on her wedding night before the groom. But this is debated by some historians, and I truly hope that this one is actually untrue. Number 10 is the Pet Patrol. Do you guys remember the scene in Disney's Aladdin where he steals a piece of fruit and miraculously evades capture? Well, in real ancient Egypt, our prince wouldn't have stood a chance as police in Egypt used baboons to catch thieves. Incredibly intelligent, these animals were able to be trained, which paired with their speed and ability to jump to places that are difficult for humans to reach, made them the perfect crime fighters. Baboons could also easily remember the face of any thief as they are ranked third in the animal world for their memory. So don't go relying on any luck to get away with anything. Outside of their police duties, they were treated incredibly kindly, but trained to participate in picking fruit, making beer, and even dancing. Baboons were so beloved by Egyptians that some mummies were later found to have tattoos of baboons on their bodies. In ancient Egyptian mythology, baboons are best known for their association with Hoth, the god of wisdom. However, they were linked to many other gods as well. Well, definitely nothing like Babu in Aladdin. But wait, did I say tattoo? Well, being inked up is no modern phenomena. Number nine is tatted up tuts. Egyptians join indigenous, Nordic, African, and many other cultures of having a history of tattooing. Now, Egyptian tattooing was bizarre just because it was exclusive to only women. By tattooing in public regions of the body, the tattoos were intended to permanently mark the woman's association with religious worship, or on the flip side, they could also be used to symbolize the low lower class and the mark of a dancing girl or a prostitute. That's what also makes it so bizarre. We can't really figure out why